Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and this week I try to do something I never do. I try to restore a hand tool, and then I try to actually use that hand tool. This type of saw is called an Uga, and no, I don't know that I'm saying that correctly, but it's a rip saw, meaning it's made to cut with the grain, not across the grain, and it's used to cut things like slabs and posts by traditional Japanese woodworkers and hipster American woodworkers. And I'll let you decide which one of those camps I land a little bit closer in. And first thing I needed to do was just remove the handle. And this handle is actually pretty cool looking, but it was in pretty rough shape. So I took a little bit of time, got it popped off, and exposed the handle there. And overall, there's a lot of surface rust, but the steel is pretty solid. So I think this is going to be relatively salvageable. But first thing I wanted to do was get started on the handle. The wood that I have here is called spalted maple, and a lot of you probably already know, but if you don't know, spalted maple isn't a type of maple tree. Spalted maple is actually a fungus that gets into the maple tree, and it causes these really cool black lines, but it also causes the wood to rot. So there's kind of this sweet spot of time for after the tree dies to how long they'll leave it to try to get the cool amount of spalting, but not so spalted that the wood is unusable. And even though this stuff is pretty solid for spalted maple, we're going to go through a stabilizing process here in a little bit, which just means making the wood really, really hard and usable. It's something they do for knife handles and tool handles like this. And pretty cool process and actually the first time I've ever done it. The first thing they say to do is to heat the wood to about 200 degrees for 12 hours, I believe, to remove all possible moisture from it. Actually, the first thing they say to do is to buy a toaster oven because apparently wives will freak out if you have just a couple pieces of spalted maple in your kitchen oven. Anyway, after you get the wood heated to about 200 degrees, I put it in those plastic sacks to kind of trap in all the dryness or keep out the ambient moisture. And now I'm adding the cactus juice. And I don't know where that name comes from. I have no idea if this is actual cactus juice, but what this is, is it's essentially an epoxy. It's essentially a resin, but it won't cure until it's heated up. And so what I'm doing here is putting it in a vacuum chamber. I'm gonna let this run for, gosh, I think I let it run for about a day. I brought it up to pressure, pulled out all the moisture, and it took quite a few hours before it stopped bubbling like this. And after it did, I just locked the pressure and let it soak up that cactus juice or that stabilizing resin, whatever you want to call it. And now it's still liquidy, but what I have to do next is I have to heat this up to, I believe I have to get it to a minimum of 200 degrees and definitely read the label, don't just listen to me here. And I'm gonna heat this back up in the toaster oven and this will cause it to cure and make it basically a solid epoxy and wood chunk with no air inside and none of that soft stuff, in theory anyway. If there is one thing that YouTube is great at, it's showing insanely cool methods of removing rust from steel. So when it came time to clean this piece up, there was no way I was gonna get outdone by one of those channels that uses car batteries and salt or walnut shells or anything that didn't involve lasers. So I reached out to this local laser rust removal company, which is exactly what it sounds like it is. And if you wanna know the science behind how this works, should probably go to another channel because I have no idea, but it shoots lasers at rust and makes it disappear, which I found incredibly satisfying. I have always been a champion of technology and woodworking. I like to embrace the technology. Not everybody does, and I think that's okay, but I do feel like you're really limiting yourself if you won't embrace some cool technology like this laser rust removal, or a couple of videos ago, I showed dry ice blasting to remove rotted wood and Yes, that might change when I'm old and salty and we have robot drones that build our furniture for us powered by AI. And I'll say back in my day, a man programmed his own CNC. But for now, I do like embracing this technology. And also I reached out to my friend Hap at Nanohone and he transcribed this for me, or I guess his wife did. This maker's mark here says, Uga Amihako made in Shiga Prefecture, which I think is pretty cool. It basically says, what it is and where it was made. So big thanks to Hap at Nanohone who makes some insanely good sharpening stone and pretty much knows everything about Japanese steel. Oliver Machinery is gonna be sending me a new 12 inch helical jointer here pretty soon and I'm pretty excited about that but I have an eight inch helical jointer 
that is totally decent right now. And I have a new policy. When a tool company gives me something, instead of selling my old item, I just give it away. And the last time I did this with the with Oliver was they gave me a new planer. So I hosted a rock, paper, scissors tournament and gave away my old planer. And I'm gonna do the same thing this time. I'm gonna host a rock, paper, scissors tournament for my jointer. Might even include some other tools, but the bummer about this is it's gonna be local. And I got some negative feedback from international people and people across the country that said that it wasn't fair, that it was only open local. And I do really, really like you guys, but I don't like you guys enough to pay to ship a thousand pound tool across the country or across the world. So to make up for that, in honor of this Japanese saw, I bought a bunch of really legit good Japanese hand saws, and I'm going to be doing a giveaway with that. And if you want all the information on it, there's a link in the description, but basically there's going to be three winners. It's free to enter, and this one is not eligible for anybody local. If you're from Portland, don't even think about entering this. This is only for the people outside of Portland, so just don't tell me you're from Portland anyway. Either way, there's more information in the video description and Really looking forward to this jointer giveaway, but if you can't make it for that, hopefully you can have a chance to win these hand saws. Some of my more observant viewers might be wondering why I spent all the time with the laser rust removal just to come home and break out the angle grinder and orbital sander. And I'm just going to let you guys ponder that like people ponder the hidden meanings behind old movies and old songs. And speaking of old songs, actually, I have a slight retraction to make. A a couple videos ago, I was comparing wood species to bands, and in that I said that Bob Seger was amazing, Led Zeppelin was pretty good, but then I said that the Beatles were just an average band, and I hate to publicly make a retraction, but Led Zeppelin was not just pretty good. Led Zeppelin was incredible, and yes, the Beatles were just an average band, and I feel like I finally found my people. I had hundreds of comments of people saying that yes, somebody finally said it, the Beatles weren't that good. and. Even the pro Beatles people basically only said that the Beatles changed music, not that they actually made good music. So thank you to everybody that confirmed what we all deep down knew in our hearts, the Beatles were just an average band. If you think that recess looks a little shoddy, remember this handle is hand hammered, so it varies in thickness and texture across it, so you can't really cut out a piece that's going to fit it just like an absolute glove. So we're going to fix that with some resin and knife pins later, but for now we're going to work on the sharpening. Normally if you do a lot of handsaw sharpening you use a really specialized vise used to support the blade during the process. I don't do a lot of handsaw sharpening and this is a really weird shaped blade. So what I did, jointed a couple pieces of white oak, screwed them together and just clamped all of that to my workbench. Now I've never actually sharpened a handsaw before, so I did what anybody should do, went to YouTube, watched one video, and now I think I can pretty much call myself an expert. The steps, as I understand them though, are to come through here, flatten all the teeth to the same height with a file, come back, flatten this edge, then come back, flatten this edge, and what I'm going for, to essentially make every tooth like a little chisel, and that sounds easy enough, but we'll see how I do. I did buy one specialized file for this, but for the most part, these were files that I already had in hand. This is just a crescent file that I have from Home Depot, which is probably a little aggressive, but I had a lot of material to remove off the tops there. And this is a feather edge file that is specifically made for sharpening Japanese saws. This was something that was recommended to me by Hap at Nanohone, and it wasn't very aggressive, but it did a really nice clean job, you can see there of straightening out that back or that front, whichever side of the blade or the tooth that actually is right there. And each tooth, got it probably took me a couple minutes, but I was pretty encouraged because it at least was getting somewhere. And that feather edge file did a really pretty good job. I just had to show some patience, which isn't always my strongest suit, but all in all, got all of them shiny and straight, which I figured was a pretty good start. pretty unpleasant. It took about probably an hour and a half or so. We got that side of all the teeth done. They actually look pretty good for who's doing it anyway. Got to flip this whole thing around, do the other side of the teeth, um, and then I, I hope they're sharp after that. I 
said after initially filing the teeth that it was a pretty painful process, but for some reason after I got into a rhythm here, I actually kind of enjoyed the process. It was a little bit peaceful and cathartic, and right now we should have sharp teeth and hopefully they don't break. I had some questions on social media where people want to know, where do you even find a saw like this? And this one was actually really interesting. I was in one of those shops that was like a, like a curio shop and it was owned by an old Japanese guy and he had crazy stuff from around the world and I was immediately drawn to this saw. I was hanging up in the back of the shop and I asked him how much he wanted for it and he said, it's not for sale. And of course I thought that was a negotiating tactic so I offered him $300 and he said, nope, I can't sell it at any price. And I was pretty discouraged, but then his grandson came up to me and said, hey, we really need the money meet me outside and bring the cash and thought that was a little shady but I went ahead and I did it I really wanted the saw and he did say there were some rules that came with the saw though he said first thing never get it wet and that made total sense you don't want to get old steel like this wet it'll rust really quick and then he said that I shouldn't expose it to sunlight which I hadn't heard anything about any UV instabilities with this old Japanese steel but he would know better than me and finally he said that I should never use this after midnight and that's the one I can't make sense of. I wonder if it kind of harkens back to some sort of old Japanese union rules, but if you know anything about that, definitely let me know. So far, the handle was starting to take shape, and if I'm being honest, it's not a shape I really liked at this point, but I figured if I kept going with these hand tools, I could work it into a little bit more attractive shape, and at least one that was pretty comfortable. And I will say the spalted maple looks awesome. That's one of my favorite woods, especially for doing a handle like this. And here's another trick I've picked up along the way is putting the sander in a vise. And this gives you a little bit more freedom when sanding these small objects like a handle. And I have that extra soft interface pad on there. And what I'm doing here, sanded it from 100 all the way up to 800 grit. And this is gonna enable me to put it directly on my buffing machine and get it to kind of a medium high gloss. This type of buffing stabilized woods is something that's totally new to me, so I would recommend you go find another video and not use this as a reference if you want to try this yourself. I, I did learn one lesson, and that was not to use the green compound. It kind of embedded itself in the wood, and I ended up having to sand it down and doing it over with this white compound after asking some people on Instagram. But overall, I think it looks pretty good. These wheels I got, I think, were really low quality. They were just from Amazon, and they just threw shrapnel everywhere. So don't recommend these wheels. The compounds seem to work pretty well. I know there's a number of different colored compounds for kind of various grits or aggressiveness. And in the end, I think it did an adequate job of buffing this out to kind of a semi-gloss. There was an additional step I wanted to take to get the steel looking exactly the way I had envisioned. And here's a better example of it. This is an old Japanese chisel that I sanded down and that's called cold bluing. It's an oxidation process that really helps prevent rust, but for me, the reason I really wanted to use it is it gives a really cool, deep, bluish, black, natural kind of hand-forged look, and the steps to do this aren't very difficult. You basically get it really clean, wipe it on, rinse it off with cold water, come back with some steel wool, kind of buff off that surface rust, and then the last thing you do is apply a little bit of this three-in-one type oil to really lock it in. I think for 24 hours or so, they say you need to leave this oil on. I should probably tape this. Actually, I kind of hate it. You, wait, is it the shape? Is it the color? What, what don't you like about it? Um, I don't like all of it. So, do you want to redo it? Are you gonna, can you fix it at all? Uh, I don't know. I think it looks stupid. I think, I think I put a lot of work into it and I think Probably the original one looks better, so I don't want to use it. I'll show you what it looks like anyway. So yeah, I think it's a stupid design and it's comfortable. I like the way it feels, but I think I don't like it and I don't want to look at it.
When it comes to restoring anything, whether it's a vintage International Scout like I used to have, or a vintage Japanese saw like I have here, there's generally two schools of thought. And one camp says you can never deviate from the original style and you need to keep it as original as possible. The other camp says it's okay to infuse things like modern technology and a little bit of modern flair. And I generally gravitate towards that second camp, whereas if you want to put Lamborghini seats in your vintage Jeep, that's fine as long as it looks cool and it's yours. But that's what I was trying to do with that spalted maple handle and I think I just failed. I think I just made a really poor design. It didn't look good, kind of felt good, but other than that, I didn't like any aspect of it. So this time, instead of that, I'm going a little bit more traditional. This is a white oak handle that I'm making, and this is actually made out of that same vise that I used to sharpen the blades. And this is gonna be a little less flare, but I know it's gonna look good because I have some white oak handles on some Japanese chisels that I have, and it looks awesome. So. Not as much razzle dazzle, but I do think that this is going to look better in the end. If you are a regular to my channel, you know that normally I build furniture here, not necessarily restore tools. But one of the questions I frequently get is people will ask, what can they do if they're starting a YouTube channel to have a little bit of success? And I keep coming back to the fact that I just make stuff that I would want to see. And first off, I love doing this stuff. I would do this whether I'm making a video or not. And I love watching these tool restoration videos. So it's something I have a lot of fun with. And I actually have a project. It won't be up for probably over a year, but it's actually gonna be my first project without any wood. And I promise you're gonna like it. It is gonna be really, really cool. In fact, here's a little clip of it. I'll pause. Oh God, it's heavy. And the first person that can actually guess what this is in the comments, I will send them a prize. I think I have an extra epoxy cutting board sitting out there somewhere that I will send you at no charge. And also be aware of these scammers in the comments. If it doesn't say Blacktail Studio and it sa instead says, contact my WhatsApp with a big long number, that is not me. Anybody can use my icon, not anybody can use my screen name with a little check mark next to it. So if you have an idea what that project is, leave a comment and let me know. If you're the first person to get it, I will send you something really cool. When I came back the next day and removed that painter's tape, I thought this actually removed that bluing from the steel and I got a little bit discouraged and I didn't think that painter's tape should remove an oxidized blued finish, but that turns out that wasn't the problem, but that was a tomorrow problem. For now, I was gonna work on this handle and painter's tape did kind of tint that handle a little bit, which wasn't a big deal because I was gonna refinish it anyway after installing this pin. And this wasn't part of the traditional plan. This is gonna be a little bit off brand or not so traditional, but I'm using a, I think it was about a three eighths inch bit here. And this just matched the pin that I got from Etsy just perfectly. And I had done a couple test pieces to make sure that this was going to fit just perfectly. Cause if you're off by a couple hundreds, that makes a big deal when you try to shove one of these pins in. And this is going to give just a really, really permanent bond. I did use epoxy to attach the handle inside, which probably would have been enough but installing this pin through the steel and the wood will make sure it's definitely permanent. And this is a dragon pin. Thought it was kind of cool. And I want to say that it was a custom made, really fancy one from Japan, but it was like $7 on Etsy. And what I found with that painter's tape is it just removed a little bit of that oil finish on there. So I used acetone, wiped the rest of it off and it looked completely uniform. I mentioned this video as a little bit of a departure for me and a little bit of an experiment. And while I enjoy watching these types of videos, I don't know that my audience necessarily does. So if you have enjoyed this video, I would love it if you hit the subscribe button right now. And if you've already subscribed or you've seen my other videos and you hate this video, it's okay to tell me. I actually take that feedback. I go through the comments every day. I don't respond to as many as I would like to. I really wish I had a little bit more time, but I do go and I read them every single day. So. I'm not above taking some honest feedback. If you guys say, hey, I didn't like it, get back to furniture. If enough people say that, I'll probably listen. If enough of you say, no, I think this was cool, it's okay to do sometimes, I'll probably listen to that. So if you feel strongly one way or another, I would love some feedback. And if you've liked this video, also love a subscription. I mentioned earlier that I watched a YouTube video to learn how to sharpen these teeth on a ripsaw blade. and. 
you want to know, the guy who made that video was Wood by Wright, and it was a really, really well done video. Everything made perfect sense and said the last thing you need to do, and don't need to do this on every single sharpening, is you need to set the teeth, basically making sure every other one is offset. Because if the teeth are in a perfectly straight line, you'll only cut the exact width of your blade and it'll bind up. So making them slightly offset will enable it to move through the wood a little bit easier. And now I'm gonna see if I can actually cut a piece of wood with this. I was about six inches into cutting this thing when I was reminded how much I love technology and not just in my tools, but in my footwear as well. Because while these tennis shoes were probably fine for using a Japanese handsaw, I don't think they were really cut out for using something like a German saw. So I went back to my Ariat carbon toe boots. These are kind of my summer heavy duty boots with the carbon toe and the leather outer shell. And yes, this is why I love technology because while Japanese might make the world's greatest saws for Americans to hang on their walls, the Germans really know how to just get things done. All right, this week, start your question or comment with the bald person you think I most closely resemble, and I will take my favorite one of those comments and repost it in a future video. Thanks so much. Have a great week.